divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. And in Bhagavad Gita, we have um, many, many wonderful instructions given. But there's one particular purport, uh, purport means commentary by Srila Prabhupada, that is very striking, uh, not only for its depth, but for its originality and uh, power. <clears throat> That's in chapter 4, and it's a fairly well-known verse, text number 10, um, which is written on the board. So I'll just sing the Sanskrit. If you can read it, you can follow me. Um, Vita Raga Bhaya Krodha Manmaya Mam Upashrita Bahavognana Tapasa Putamad Bhava Magata Vita Raga Bhaya Krodha Manmaya Mamu Pashritaha Bohavognana Tapasa Putamad Bhava Magataha Vita Raga Bhaya Krodha Manmaya Mamu Pashritaha Bahavognana tapasa Putamad bhavamagata Translation Being freed from attachment, fear, and anger, being fully absorbed in me, and taking refuge in me alone, many, many persons in the past became purified by knowledge of me, and thus they all attained transcendental love for me. Let's repeat this. Being freed from attachment, Being freed from attachment. Fear, fear, and anger. And anger. Being, fully in me, Being fully absorbed in me. And taking refuge in me. Taking refuge in me. Many, many persons in the past, many, many in the past. Became, purified became purified by knowledge of me. And thus they all attained Transcendental love for me. Now the commentary will read by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Purport. As described above, it is very difficult for a person who is too materially affected to understand the personal nature of the Supreme Absolute Truth. Described above means uh, there, was, there were previous verses providing the context. In particular, Krishna said, Bhogai Shwarya Prasaktanam Taya Sam Ityadi means <clears throat> that for those who are too attached to sense gratification, it's very difficult to make spiritual advancement. Uh, but there's more to it than that. Um, so Srila Prabhupada continues. Generally, people who are attached to the bodily conception of life are so absorbed in materialism that it is almost impossible for them to understand how the Supreme can be a person. Such materialists cannot even imagine that there is a transcendental body which is imperishable, full of knowledge, and eternally blissful. In the materialistic concept, the body is perishable, full of ignorance, and completely miserable. Therefore, people in general keep this same bodily idea in mind when they are informed of the personal form of the Lord. For such materialistic men, the form of the gigantic material manifestation is supreme. Consequently, they consider the supreme to be impersonal. And because they are too materially absorbed, the conception of retaining the personality after liberation from matter frightens them. When they are uh, informed that spiritual life is also individual and personal, they become afraid of becoming persons again, and so they naturally prefer a kind of merging into the impersonal void. Generally, they compare the living entities to the bubbles of the ocean, which merge into the ocean. That is the highest perfection of spiritual existence attainable without person individual personality. This is a kind of fearful stage of life, 
devoid of perfect knowledge of spiritual existence. Furthermore, there are many persons who cannot understand spiritual existence at all. Being embarrassed by so many theories and contradictions of various types of philosophical speculation, they become disgusted or angry and foolishly conclude that there is no supreme cause and that everything is ultimately void. Such people are in a diseased condition of life. Some people are too materially attached, therefore they do not give attention to spiritual life. Some of them want to merge into the supreme spiritual cause, and some of them disbelieve in everything, being angry at all sorts of spiritual speculation out of hopelessness. This last class of men take to the shelter of some kind of intoxication, and their affective hallucinations are sometimes accepted as spiritual vision. One has to get rid of all three stages of attachment to the material world, negligence of spiritual life, fear of, a pers of spiritual personal identity, and the conception of void that arises from frustration in life. To get free from these three stages of the material concept of life, one has to take complete shelter of the Lord, guided by the bona fide spiritual master, and follow the disciplines and regulative principles of devotional life. The last stage of devotional life is called bhava, or transcendental love of Godhead. According to the Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu, the science of devotional service, in the beginning, one must have a preliminary desire for self-realization. This will bring one to the stage of trying to associate with persons who are spiritually elevated. In the next stage, one becomes initiated by an elevated spiritual master, and under his instruction, the neophyte devotee begins the process of devotional service. By execution of devotional service under the guidance of the spiritual master, one becomes free from all material attachment, attains steadiness in self-realization, and acquires a taste for hearing about the absolute personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. This taste leads one further toward... Um, further forward to attachment for Krishna consciousness, which is matured in bhava, or the preliminary stage of transcendental love of God. Real love for God is called prema, the highest perfectional stage of life. In the prema stage, there is constant engagement in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. So by the slow process of devotional service under the guidance of the bona fide spiritual master, one can attain the highest stage, being freed from all material attachment, from the fearfulness of one's individual spiritual personality, and from the frustrations that result in void philosophy. Then one can ultimately attain to the abode of the Supreme Lord. Om Agnana Timarantasya Gnanan Janishalakaya Chakshuran Militam Nina Tasmai Shri Guruvenama Mukam Kuroti Vachalam Pangal Mlankhayate Girim Yat Kripata Maham Vande Shri Gurum Dinataranam Vita Raghav Hayakrodhaman Maya Mamu Pashrataha Bhavo Gnana Tapasa Putamad Bhavam Agataha Being freed from attachment, fear, and anger, being fully absorbed in me and taking refuge in me, many, many persons in the past became purified by knowledge of me, and thus they all attained transcendental love. For me. So what are the three things that are being mentioned here? The three things that militate against our becoming, as we say, Krishna conscious or developing love for God? We've mentioned them a few, few times. Fear. Negligence, fear, what else? Anger. So three things, Krishna says. Uh, you'll notice in the first line, Vita. Vita means it's gone. So three things should be gone. That's raga, bhaya, krodha. Raga means attachment. Uh, bhaya means fear. Krodha means anger. And they generally go in that order as well. So raga means attachment or uh, negligence due to attachment, as Prabhupada said here. We become attached to things. 
Where does the attachment develop from? Sangha, what we associate with. Sangat sanjayate kama. As we associate, that we desire. If you keep saintly association, you will desire noble spiritual goals. If you associate with base qualities or people, you will chase after those things as well. And human form of life is a very short opportunity to, well, it's called tarapi adhruvam arthadam, Prahlad Maharaj says in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Although it's a very short life, only maybe 70, maximum 100 years, but it's arthadam. It can give you something very valuable. So, raga is a distraction from ultimate value. We talk of two things. In the Upanishads, we hear of two concepts. One of them is called shreyas. The other one is preyas. Preyas means that which is immediately appealing, which is a short-term benefit, immediate interest and sensual, usually, attraction. Higher than that is shreyas, which means that which is ultimate good, which is super excellent, eminently valuable in life. That's called shreyas. So these two things are not always the same. In fact, sometimes they're against each other. Children, they want to play all day long. No, no child wants to go to school, but the parents have to push and force him to study hard so that he can later on uh, make something of his life. So that's a classic example of preyas, which is play, versus shreyas, which is education or self-development in general. So raga means we have attachment to so many things, just like in music, ranjayatiti raga, it's said. That which, which snags your mind, it's called raga. But it's not just music. It's, it's, there are visual ragas, there are taste ragas, there are touchy ragas. All these things are called raga, things that uh, we become attached to and therefore distracted by. We become pulled away from shreyas, the ultimate goal of life, by the immediately appealing things of the senses. Usually they're sensual, sometimes mental also. So that's raga. And on account of raga, we become afraid because there are two sides to the coin. If you have pleasure in the material world, then to the extent that you get attached to the body-mind complex enough to enjoy it, you must also, also suffer when the body-mind inevitably undergoes some sort of suffering. You cannot have one without the other. The same variety that produces your happiness, material happiness, it is that variety which will produce your pain, sooner or later. Tamal Krishna Goswami, one of the great uh, acharyas in our line, he used to say that uh, three things are possible. One, you can never get what you want and you remain frustrated. That we've, it's the next word, krotha. Or another thing is that you can get what you want and it doesn't satisfy you, so you have to go chasing after something else. <laughs> or you can get what you want, but because it's temporary, you're going to lose it. So either way, you end up the loser, and you cannot be happy with this mundane raga. Therefore, bhaya, when people are informed that spiritual life, eternal life, also has variety, also has personality, individual, individuality, relations. <laughs> How much pain is caused in this world through relationships, isn't it? Uh, so when people hear that spiritual life involves all these things, they oh, no, no, I've already been there. And therefore they take to some sort of what we call nirvishesha or shunyavadi, uh, impersonalism or worse still, voidism. Hmm. So that's based on the principle of fear. Out of attachment and being burned through that attachment, we become fearful. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone recognizes that this is a problem and tries to do something to get out of it, then he has a third difficulty, and that is uh, the cause of his krodha. He becomes frustrated because we all know there are so many religions in the world, right? Um, half of them are fighting one another. Um, so religions, and then there's also uh, atheistic philosophies, and so many things, they sound good. Vayurgandhani vashayat, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita elsewhere. They're just like uh, aromas are wafting through the air, we have that many Weltanschauungen, uh, as they say in German. It's that many worldviews. Hmm? 
And we can be snagged by any one of those just as much as we can be snagged by the attractions of our senses or by the fears of our psyche. So it's a very dangerous path in human form of life. We can great, get great value, but it's very easy to become bewildered also. So these are the three things. These are the three things that keep us from uh, realizing our ultimate potential and especially approaching the Supreme Lord. But Krishna says there are some stages here. Actually, we can look at this. Uh, look at the third line. Bahavognana tapasa puta. That can be taken as one unit. Purified, puta, because of the austerity of knowledge. Many, many people have been so purified. Now, way back, this is not a new thing. That's the, whole, that's the first point of the verse, Krishna says. It's been coming, bahavo, many, many people have done this. So at least maybe a thousand years ago, almost, nearly a thousand years ago, one great Vaishnava Acharya named Ramanuja Acharya, uh, some of you have heard of him. Uh, he is commenting on this verse. What is the meaning of jnana tapasa? Jnana tapasa. What does tapasya mean? Austerity. Austerity or difficulty. Tapas. Tapas means to burn. <laughs> no pain, no gain. This is my Sanskrit professor used to tell us. Um, so he says that the trouble of studying the scripture, that is an austerity. It's not easy. After all, think about it. You have to pick up the book with your hands. You have to be that strong. You have to turn the pages, right? You have to take 50 steps outside these doors after the class ends, and you have to see the smiling South Indian brahmachari at the book table and part with $5 to buy the Bhagavad Gita. That's austerity. But that's not the real austerity. What comes after that? It's not a physical austerity. It's difficult, not so much because the concepts are hard or because none of us have the intelligence, we do. But we have a mental block. It's, 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 a, it's a hassle to, to ponder uh, so many ideas, especially if we're already angry about the frustration of that process, right? So it's an austerity, but that's only half the picture. Later our charges after Ramanuja charges, they say, well, there's another way to look at this. Tasmin jnana, in this particular kind of jnana, it's not just austere to develop that jnana or to seek it. It's also austere to deal with people who don't have it. People, people will attack you. If you uh, go to work tomorrow, for example, with a bald head and tilak and Vaishnava dress chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, it will be a little difficult. You don't have to do that, by the way. <laughs> but the point is that when you are practicing spiritual life in a world that is essentially full of material interests and people who are dedicated to those interests, it becomes very difficult because you're going against the grain. Yanisha sarva bhutanam, Krishna says, just like night and day. What is night for the materialist is daytime for the introspective and vice versa. So he says the austerity, the jnana tapasa involved in, in becoming purified through developing knowledge, it is also having to deal with other people and their opposing arguments. In other words, to preach, to preach Krishna consciousness. Now Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given all of us this instruction, but particularly the Indians, what does he say? Bharata bhumite hoila manusha janmajar janmashar thakori koroparu pakar. Those who have been socialized with uh, the civiliz civilized values of Vedic culture and have been given some degree of spiritual life, at least more than the next man, they have the responsibility to share it. And when you're sharing thing, this knowledge, sometimes the audience is not appreciative or receptive, and that's an austerity. So, Baladevi Dabhushan, uh, perhaps four or five hundred years ago, he gives us this insight, as had... Um, um, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur before him. So, uh, tapas, uh, he says, dhira. One has to become dhira. Uh, and he quotes from the Taitreya Upanishad. Tasya dhiram parijananti yonim. That is to say, somebody who is aware of Krishna's appearance and activities in this world, who has cultivated that knowledge, this person, he must be dhira. He must be sober. 
I'm just going to read the previous text to give you some context. Janma karma chame divyam evam yoveti tatvata chaktva dehum punarjanma naiti mam eti sorjana. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in the material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. This is Krishna speaking to Arjuna. So what he's mentioning in the previous text as Janma is, according to the Acharyas, the same thing which is mentioned in the Shruti Mantra as Yonim. Uh, Krishna's appearance in this world, which is coming up soon, uh, it's transcendental. And all of his activities within this world, they're also transcendental, even though they're personal. So this is the thing. If we can grip this, if we can uh, ascertain this, if we can appreciate this, then we will not be afraid of spiritual individuality, s- spiritual personality, including the Lord's personality. You see? So this is a great uh, service that we've been rendered by the Acharyas who comment on these verses. Now, <clears throat> taking this background, Srila Prabhupada has given us a unique and updated version of the same message. Usually, when I speak, I like to emphasize Srila Prabhupada's f- fidelity to his tradition and the fact that he normally simply paraphrases the commentaries of the predecessor acharyas or predecessor saints in this line. And certainly he's done so in spirit today, but his, his purport, as you've heard, we've read it already, he's making altogether original contributions in that he focuses particularly on those persons who are opposed to Krishna consciousness, the persons uh, who will create austerities for the rest of us who are trying to practice Krishna consciousness. He focuses entirely on those, and he brings to light the significance of the, of the words that are mentioned in the first line, Raga Bhaya Krodha. His entire purport, three or four times he mentions these things again and again, pointing out that these are the enemies, this attachment, this fear, and this frustration or this anger. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, out of anger, uh, when people are afraid of spir- uh, in either material or spiritual personality, for that matter, um, because of their excessive attachment to the body and the mind and its byproducts, uh, they must necessarily become angry. What is the, the sequence that we learn from chapter 2 of the Bhagavad Gita? Anybody know what I'm thinking of? Visha- uh, no. Jayato Vishayan Pungsa. Sangas te shupa jayate, sangat sanjayate kama. Okay, so we get our desires from our association. Kamat krodho bhijayate. When the desire is frustrated, then we become angry. So when your spiritual desire is frustrated, you become angry. When your material desire is frustrated, you also become angry. So what does it take to fulfill these desires? Yeah, well, material desires we know, they cannot be fulfilled. I've already given you the three outcomes. <laughs> but spiritual desire can be fulfilled. You can have your individuality. You can have personality. You can have variety. Sensuality even, I, I dare say. Uh, I like to use the word supramundane, suprasensuality. It's, it's of a transcendental nature. This is the absolute truth. You see? And these, this information we have from Vedic literature is not so much in Bhagavad Gita, but particularly in Srimad Bhagavatam and other uh, shastras that we study. So, um, when we uh, can fulfill our highest aspirations for personal existence and person, reciprocation, loving reciprocation, relationships, interaction, variety, activity, Society, friendship, love, on and on and on. These, the things that drive us in material existence, they are available eternally, but not here. One has to look in spiritual life for the satisfaction of these desires. So they will not be frustrated, but there is one crucial step uh, to prevent this kind of krodha that comes from the frustration of our spiritual aspiration. And that is how Srila Prabhupada chose to wind up his commentary here. He's uh, kind of uh, summarizing the general process or the stages of spiritual advancement, but he emphasizes what really makes this whole thing go. 
And that is when we can approach a bona fide spiritual master and hear from him the science of love of Godhead, because it is a science. Uh, we don't usually think of love in terms of science, but it, it really is. And just as by contemplating material sense objects, we become attached and develop desires and perform activities that entangle us in material existence, in similar ways, uh, we can become uh, absorbed in love of Godhead. And that's what Krishna is talking about here when he says, Manmaya. Manmaya means absorbed in me. Why are they absorbed in him? Mam upashritaha, because they have taken shelter of him. They're, they're puta, jnana tapasa, we've already discussed. They're freed from the ragad paya krodha. And uh, madbhavam agata, they have already attained me. This is past tense, this verb. It's already a done deal. You have simply to look in the past and find so many examples of those who have gone before and who have successfully carried out this process. So it's not just a new thing. This is going on a long, long time, Krishna says. And we can turn it around. We can say this is not just an ancient thing <laughs> for the forefathers and grandfathers and old-fashioned people. It's also happening right now. Those who take the trouble to lift up the Bhagavad Gita and read it, as we mentioned already, uh, who can part with five dollars to buy one, or who uh, decide to purchase a japa mala and chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, they are experiencing something that uh, sustains them in that practice. So many devotees are in this temple, you can approach them and uh, inquire from them, what is it about this process that appeals to you? You can learn this way. Or better yet, you can try it yourself. There, it's free. There's nothing uh, charged here. Um, <clears throat> so Srila Prabhupada, as I said, he's given a very powerful and unique and uh, most of all, I think, relevant uh, uh, modern, uh, for the modern man, uh, uh, synopsis of the real essence of this instruction by Krishna. A very uh, encouraging verse. Krishna says, you're not alone in this. The many, many people have gone before you. You can take advantage of their literatures. I've par been paraphrasing some of them throughout the class. There are so many comments on this very verse. That so many others have had their realizations. They've entered into the spirit of the text through their practical activities. Uh, we can have association in this way. And Srila Prabhupada worked very hard, uh, for those of you who don't know. Uh, while we all slept at night, Srila Prabhupada was very busy during the day, and at night he slept maybe only two or three hours maximum. The rest of the time he was working hard translating all these books so that we could read them. Let us not uh, ignore them and let them rot and get dusty. Let us put it into practice in our lives, and we will become happy simply by the simple process of appealing to the Supreme Lord by chanting his holy name. Hare Krishna. <clears throat>Sattvic happiness means we are concerned primarily with prayas, the ultimate good. Rajasic or passionate happiness, that means we are concerned with things that are immediate and, and usually sensual. And they burn us out. We get burned by that. This is the idea. For modes of passion things. Yeah, very good. How does a person get out of the desire for, or the attachment to the mode of passion? Let's read Bhagavad Gita very carefully. If we do that, we'll see in chapters 14 and 17 and 18, Krishna discusses at some length the nature of each of these three modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance. 
So if we've read, we know that the, the primary characteristic of, or the, I shall I say, the, um, the indicator of the mode of passion is, what's the primary indicator of passion? What is the meaning of the word passion? Intense longing, desire, right? So we have desire, I've already said that. You don't have to give up desire, but you do have to redirect it. If you're investing your attachment or your desires or your passions in something material, something temporary, which will be lost at, some, at a certain point, then you're going to be frustrated, that we've already said. So the key, Krishna says, is, yet karoshi arishnasi yad johoshi dadasi yad yad tapasyasi kontaya tat kurushamadarvanam. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you accept, whatever you give away, anything you do, you should do it as an offering to me. That is also means uh, that whatever you desire, you should desire for Krishna. If you're hungry, feed Krishna. If you're a musician, sing for Krishna. Right? Whatever you do, please Krishna by your energies. Whatever God-given talents we have, for only a short while, they're borrowed plumes, my friend. <laughs> we are so proud of whatever we are, we think it's us. It's not. Just like that, it can be gone. It will be. But whatever we have in this short time that we, that we have with us, if we give it to Krishna, that is our eternal benefit. Krishna says, you will not lose. Whatever you invest in this account, it re remains eternally. Okay? Anything else? Yes, Shachi Tanoi Prabhu. Prabhu, uh, you were talking about austerities and uh, how do you deal with the, in conveying your message or sharing your spiritual knowledge with other spiritual groups who might think that everything is fine, they're satisfied, their knowledge is complete, they don't even, probably even need the knowledge that you're offering because they're complete. For example, Buddhism. Yeah. You can name anyone. Well, I don't want to uh, quibble here, but technically speaking, Buddhism is not a spiritual process because Buddhism does not accept the existence of spirit. Uh, we call it a religion, kind of a misnomer, I think, uh, in a sense, uh, because there's a lot of waving incense at deities and things like that, even in Buddhism. You can't keep the devotional spirit in, in the human heart down. <laughs> even if you call it atheism, it comes out. Um, but with other uh, religious, in a general sense of the term, with other religious groups or religious practitioners, we have to be sensitive and empathetic. Um, Krishna says in chapter 6 here that the person who has real empathy uh, on the basis of his own personal experience that person can be the best yogi. Atma upam yena sarvatra. You know the offhand? Atma upam yena sarvatra. Anyway, just now I forget, but uh, that's the idea. So empathy is one thing, but then another thing is that if a person cannot understand the truth in another's religion, then he probably doesn't have a very deep understanding of the same truth within his own. So this is a thing. We have to go deep into our own process and we will be able to appreciate the um, essential oneness of that process, however it's manifest elsewhere. This is not to say that all religions are the same. They're not. I don't think all religions are of the same value. Some are better than others. That I believe. But there is value in all, and it's better to take a positive approach in our interactions with others. That's what I can say. Is that all right? Anything else? Yes, please. Can other processes lead you to Krishna as well? Can other processes lead you to Krishna as well? I think so. Someone once asked Srila Prabhupada, what about sincere Christians? What happens if you're a sincere Christian? Anyone know what Prabhupada answered to that question? He said a sincere Christian will join this movement. <laughs> <laughs> That's our answer. 
like I said, we, we don't say they're all the same in, in value, but they, they all have some value. That's the point. So everybody has his own faith, uh, so be it. That's the individuality and the personality and the personal desire that's, that Krishna allows all living entities. But the best, the best uh, process of love of Godhead according to Srimad Bhagavatam is that by which a person can attain the maximum amount of pure devotion, which is freed from any kind of personal um, uh, agenda or, and, and, and doesn't have any kind of interruption as well. Yes, Swavas Prabhu. Yes. Um, how do you deal with this uh, thing of authority and exploitation uh, in terms of following a particular path? You know, like if, if it's very difficult to surrender to authority and then after you do, then there's this fear of exploitation. So yeah. when we speak of religion and, and, yeah. and how we should approach it, what, how do you, what can you say in terms of those two items? Well, first of all, there's truth in the adage that uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We've seen this in the history of world religions. Some of the worst crimes that you can even think of have been perpetrated in the name of God. Uh, it's true. So we have to be very discriminating. And this is where the process of Krishna consciousness, I think, is of more help than other uh, religious processes or spiritual processes because in Krishna consciousness, we have a very, very comprehensive, specific, precise, and authoritative science of how to develop this love of Godhead. Srila Prabhupada has just kind of run through the stages very quickly in this purport, and I didn't really even have time to dilate on those stages, but they're very, very important. So one of the things that allows Krishna consciousness to avoid a lot of the pitfalls of um, spiritual, um, materially motivated spirituality that, that burns people out, uh, both the practitioners and the, uh, both the exploited and the exploited, um, and Krishna consciousness bypasses those because it has, it has nailed these processes very clearly. And we can, if we're forewarned, what do they say? Forewarned is whatever that, I forget what it is now, but to be forewarned of something, it can help you to avoid it. Uh, that's one thing. And then we have the holy name of Krishna. And the holy name of Krishna is Krishna directly in this age. He's incarnated in this particular form. By chanting this holy name, the heart becomes purified because you can have all the knowledge in the world. You can have undergone the austerity of study and you can be sober or dhira enough that you can tolerate having to deal with people who haven't. But if your heart's not pure, then that's a problem. And so we have to chant the holy name. All right, these are two, I mean, these are huge questions. We could spend a long, long time on each of them, but I hope that's okay. <laughs> okay, I'll stop here. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Yeah.